Let's unmute this. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the FCC's webinar on the Connect America Fund Phase 2 or CAF 2 auction. I'm Chelsea Fallon, the director of the FCC's Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force. With me are Heidi Lenko, an attorney in the Wireline Competition Bureau's Telecommunications Access Policy Division, and Martha Stansel, an economist in the Wireless Bureau's Auctions and Spectrum Access Division, as well as other Bureau staff who are on hand to answer questions. So today we're going to walk through the application and bidding procedures that were proposed in the CAF 2 auction comment public notice, which was adopted by the Commission on August 3rd. Heidi is going to give a high level overview of the proposed application procedures and Martha is going to explain the proposed auction design and bidding procedures. She will go through the basics of bidding and what happens before and after the budget clears, how winning bids will be assigned and support amounts determined, as well as package bids and proxy instructions. All of these topics are covered in the comment PN and the related technical guide. And we refer you to these documents for more detail and examples. And just to go over a few housekeeping items before we, we begin, the webinar is listen only, so there is no way to voice question, questions during the event. However, you can email questions during and at the end of the webinar to the email address on the screen, auction903 at fcc.gov. After we've concluded the webinar presentation, we'll take a short break for about 15 minutes and then we'll come back and answer the questions that were emailed in during, um, during the webinar and the break. And in case you are on the phone bridge, but you're not able to log in and you're being asked for an event number, the number is 390-5858. And then if you think of a question after today, you can send it to this email address and someone from the staff will follow up with you individually. The webinar is also being recorded and the recording will be posted on the FCC's website sometime later this week on the event page where you found the information for today's webinar. The webinar is meant to be educational and to explain information contained in the CAF 2 comment public notice. Therefore, participation in the webinar does not require an ex parte filing. If you would like to meet with us to discuss the merits or the outcome of the matters raised in the comment PN, that would require an ex parte filing. And you can contact us to arrange such a meeting at a later date. Okay, and I'm just going to give that event number out one more time in case folks need it. It is 390-585-158. Again, that's 390-585-158. Hopefully everyone has it. So as I mentioned, the, the CAF2 comment PN proposes and seeks comment on the application and bidding procedures for the auction. Comments are due September 18th and reply comments are due October 18th. The next steps after that are for the commission to publish the final map and list of the eligible areas for the auction and to release the procedures public notice. The procedures PN will adopt the final rules for the auction and announce the auction start date and application filing deadline. We plan to commence the auction 
sometime in 2018. So why are we holding the reverse auction for CAF 2? The decision goes back to the FCC 2011 transformation order, which adopted extensive reforms to the Universal Service Program. These included the decision to use competitive bidding to distribute CAF phase two support in areas of the country where model-based support have been declined by incumbent price cap carriers. An auction is an efficient mechanism to determine how much of the funds in the fixed budget should go to specific providers in specific areas of the country. The fixed budget would not be enough to cover the sum of the reserve prices for all of the areas in the auction. So competition in the auction will continue until the support amounts based on the bids are greater than or equal to the budget and until there is no competition among bidders for the same area. We will only award support for at most one bidder per area. And Martha will explain this in greater detail shortly. So I mentioned that the CAF to comment pan proposes certain application and bidding procedures for the auction. However, some of the decisions for the auction were already made in earlier commission orders, and these are a few of them. The auction will distribute up to $1.98 billion in support over 10 years. And this is the budget for the auction. The areas eligible for support include the areas where price cap carriers declined support, as well as some other areas. Bidders will bid to provide different levels of service based on downstream and upstream speeds, usage allowances, and latency. Providers who are awarded support will have six years to deploy service, and there will be interim build-out milestones. And finally, there are two application stages for the auction. The short form application stage is before the auction, and the short form must be filed by any party that wishes to participate in the auction. The long form application comes after the auction and is filed by winning bidders. It includes additional details that winning bidders must provide in order to receive support. I will now turn the presentation over to Heidi Lanko, who will discuss the proposed application procedures. Thank you, Shelby. The Common Public Notice proposes collecting additional information in the Auction 903 short form application to help promote an effective, efficient, and fair auction and to facilitate Commission staff's evaluation of whether a bidder is qualified to participate in the auction. First, the Public Notice proposes to require each applicant to select the state for which it intends to bid for support. To safeguard against coordinated bidding, the public notice proposes to prohibit applicants that are commonly controlled or that are parties to a joint bidding arrangement from bidding in the same state. Requiring each applicant to identify the state for which it intends to bid will allow commission staff to enforce this prohibition. The public notice explains different options each party has for applying to avoid or work to resolve any impermissible state overlap. Second, the public notice proposes to have the applicant establish at the short form stage its eligibility to bid for the performance tier and latency combinations it has selected in its application on a state by state basis. The public notice proposes to collect in the short form application specific high level operational information from each applicant, as well as specific information about an applicant's access to spectrum if the applicant intends to use spectrum, in order to demonstrate that the applicant could provide broadband service at the selected performance tier and latency combination. The public notice also proposes to leverage existing commission data, like FCC Form 477 deployment and subscriber data to aid commission staff in making eligibility determinations. Third, the public notice proposes to determine 
each applicant's eligibility to bid based on certain financial metrics. The financial metrics would be scored and each low scoring applicant would be subject to a more in-depth review of its finances to determine its eligibility to bid in order to prevent bidders that would be financially incapable of providing service from participating in the auction. Applicants not required to submit audited financial statements at the short form stage would be required to submit unaudited financial statements with their short form applications. That's a very high level overview of the short form application proposals in the comment public notice. Martha will now discuss the proposed auction design and bidding procedures. Thank you, Heidi and Chelsea. My goal today is to introduce you to the mechanics of how the actual auction will work so that you'll get a good idea of it. And if you have more detailed questions from there, you can look them up or ask us for clarification. So at the highest level, here is a schematic that describes how this reverse multiple round auction will work. It will start in a preview period in which you can make a decision about whether to participate or not in the auction, given the support prices that you may receive if you win. We'll open a round, you'll place bids, the round will close, we'll look at the bids, you'll look at the results. And if there's still competition for the budget and for areas, We'll have another round with a lower uh, clock percentage. So, and that will continue. We'll keep going around in that circle until all competition is resolved. So to start with what you need to know to bid, what is a bid? In this case, it's a request for support in a given area for a given performance tier and latency at a given percentage. And all of that will correspond to a support amount. We'll talk about that in a little while. An area consists of the eligible census blocks in the census block group. Performance tier and latency options were determined earlier by the commission. There are four types, minimum, baseline, above baseline and gigabit performance tiers based on speed and usage metrics. And there are two categories of latency, high and low. Once a round is closed and you've submitted a bid for an area at a given performance tier and latency um, at a certain percentage, a submitted bid obliges you to provide that level of service at a support amount corresponding to that if you if you win. Now, going forward for most of this presentation, I'm going to discuss bids for single areas. Later, I'll mention package bidding, but think of this as just you can place bids for different single areas. Okay, now to start defining some of the terms I've used already. Reserve prices. And by the way, what I'm going to describe is a proposal. Um, and I will probably forget to mention that every time, but keep in mind that what's in the comment PN is a request for comment on proposed procedures. Each area will be associated with a reserve price. And this will limit the amount of support a bidder can receive for the area. The reserve price is set prior to the auction using the Connect America cost model. And for each census block group, the reserve price is the sum of the support amounts calculated by the cost model for each of the eligible census blocks within the census block group. And there's a cap on extremely high cost census blocks.
Okay, so how do you figure out what amount of support corresponds to a bid for at a certain percentage for a certain area at a certain um, tier and latency combination? The clock, as I've said earlier, or if I haven't said, is denominated in terms of a percentage. So it will tick down in terms of declining percentages. To determine the implied support amounts, that bid percentage will be adjusted for the performance tier and latency and multiplied by the area's reserve price. I'll be more specific about the formula in a minute. The Commission already determined adjustment weights that are associated with each possible performance tier and latency combination. I'll refer to these as T plus L since it's kind of a long um, phrase otherwise. So the T plus L for the highest level of performance is at low latency is zero gigabit performance tier. Um, that weight ranges from zero there the lowest up to 90 for a minimum performance tier at high latency. And we will convert all of these different pieces into an implied support amount using the formula on the next slide. Okay, here is the math for the formula. It, it's easy to work out. Um, PP here is the bid percentage, the price point. T plus L is the weight. R is the area's reserve price. And minimum just reflects the fact that we won't give you more than the reserve price in support for a given area. So if the result of the calculation is greater than the reserve price, the most you will get is the reserve price. Okay, here's an example. Um, you wish to provide baseline service at low latency in a certain area, certain census block group. The area has a reserve price R of $200. From the table a couple slides back, you can see that that corresponded to a T plus L weight of 45. In the base clock percentage, we assume for this example, is 150%. More later on why it's higher than 100%. Okay, therefore we just plug those numbers into the formula. And we get the minimum of 200, or a little more than 200, 1.05 times 200, which is the minimum of the reserve price 200, and 210. The formula gave us a number higher than the reserve price. So your implied support amount here is 200, the reserve price. OK, the clock decrements by 10 percentage points in the next round. Say it's at 140 percent. So plug those new numbers into the formula and we get the minimum of 200 and 140 minus 45 over 100 times reserve price 200. And that comes out to the minimum 200 and 190. So in this case the minimum is 190, the formula support amount. And that's your implied support amount at the base clock percentage of 140%. So just to walk through this in a slightly different way, we're back on our example about reserve price 200, T plus L is 45. The clock, the auction may have opened at 170%, for example. Round one, it may have fallen to 160%. That, using the formula, implied support at $200. In the next round, the clock percentage fell again to 150%. Again, your implied support was $200, your reserve price. In the third round, the percentage has been decremented to 140%. Your implied support is $190 and so on. At 130%, your implied support is $170.
etc. Okay, just to recap a little bit and add a little bit to what we've done so far. This is a multiple round descending clock auction. Each round is associated with a base clock percentage, which starts high and decreases for each bidding round. We propose to start the clock above 100% because we want all tier and latency combinations to be able to compete head to head. And recall that the weights range from zero to 90. So for some of those tier and latency combinations, the um, reserve price will be um, reduced a fair amount relative to a TNL with a zero weight. Okay, and bidding rounds will continue as long as there's competition among areas for a share of the budget or among bidders for support to a given area. Remember, we only will provide support to at most one bidder per area. Okay, here's an, another detail. Um, what if, you're, what if support at 140% is enough? You're willing to accept that. But at, 100, at 130%, the next decrement down, that's really not enough support to do what you would have promised to do in your bid if you could bid at 130%. You can do one of two things. You can bid at 140% and just not bid again. Or you can choose to bid at a more precise percentage an in-between percentage between the 130 base clock percentage for this round going up to, but not including the 140%. For example, assume your bottom line support amount is $175. You figure out that at 130%, 170 would not be enough. But if you bid a little higher at that, more precisely at 132.5%, your implied support is $175. So if you submit a bid at 132.5% in that round and the bid is assigned, your support will be at least $175. Now I'll also explain the at least part a little later. But so this is your basic decision. As the base clock percentage decreases, given the corresponding amount for each area, do you still want to bid for an area or do you want to drop out of bidding? Which you can do, as we said, at an intermediate percentage. Okay, another detail. We have activity rules that require two things. One, that you do not bid for more support than you did in the previous round. And this is measured at implied support dollars. So in other words, if you were bidding for a total of you know, $400 in the previous round, you can't bid for more than $400 of support in this round. And the activity rules also limit the extent to which you can switch to bid on different areas. Proposed switching percentage is 10% of the prior round's implied support for bids made at the base clock percentage. You can find those, that and other details in the PN or the technical guide with the PN. We have activity rules to encourage bidders to bid in what we call a straightforward way. And as a little aside here, during that box in which you bidders the that bubble in which you bidders will be examining the results, you will be given information telling you the number of bids that were submitted at the base clock percentage for the previous round for every area. So that will give you a good idea of the number of bidders that are bidding against you for a particular area. And the fact that we have activity rules that govern the steadiness, basically, the consistency with which bidders place bids makes that information much more reliable for you. Okay, so now we're going to move out of your 
green box where you do something to the um, blue box where the auction system does some work. It, after every round, the auction system checks for whether to see whether the budget cleared in that round. And the budget is said to clear when the total implied support for the bids at a round's base clock percentage Counting support for no more than one bid for a given area, since no more than one bidder is allowed to win a given area, is equal to or less than the budget. Now, if there are multiple bidders bidding for the same area, the auction system will count the most expensive auction in its calculation to make sure it has enough money to cover whichever bid may win. So after each round of bidding, it makes this calculation. What is what we call the um, aggregate implied support at the base clock percentage? And if the total implied support exceeds the budget, the base clock percentage is decremented again, another bidding round is conducted. Okay, so after a, you know a series of rounds, in which bidders iteratively make bids at lower clock, base clock percentages, the total implied support required to fund all the areas with, with bids will fall. There's two reasons for this, if you think about it. Each, each bid um, falls because the percentage is falling. And at some point, Bidders for different areas are dropping out because the amount of implied support associated with their bid is less than they're willing to accept to provide the corresponding level of service. So there's two reasons why the total amount of support requested is decreases through these rounds. Here's a, here's a um, graphical example. Um, we have a budget, a hypothetical budget, of $15,000 to cover all the areas that win. At the opening clock percentage of 170%, the budget greatly exceeds the 15,000. In the first round, we lower the clock percentage to 160%. And this aggregate cost at the base clock percentage is $20,000. We lower the percentage again, 150%. The cost falls again. Round three, percentage falls, the cost falls. But we're still above the budget. We still don't have enough money to cover all the areas that are requesting support. Round four, 130%. Ta-da, the budget clears. The round at the base four clock percent, the Aggregate cost at the round four base clock percentage is down to $14,000, less than the budget of $15,000. This we call the clearing round for obvious reasons. However, note that bid rounds continue as long as there are some areas with more than one bid at the, at the base clock percentage. So as I just said, this round in which the total base clock requested support falls below the budget is called the clearing round. And during the clearing round, the auction system will begin, but not finish, the process of assigning winning bids and determining final winning support amounts. One thing to just point out here Note that if there are multiple bids at the base clock percentage, that means more than one bidder has said, I'm still in at the support amount. Um, that's the lowest support we've asked about so far. So we're going to lower the clock percentage and ask them again until we get to a point at which somebody bids out, uh, drops out, or more than one bidder bids out, oh, excuse me, drops out and we're down to one bidder per area. Okay, 
how does the system assign bids during the clearing round? At a very high level, the auction system starts with bids at the base clock percentage. And if there's a bid for an area at the base clock percentage and no other bids for that area, that bid is quote assigned or determined to be a winning bid. And it does that for all the areas at which there are no, um, no other bids for the same area at the base clock percentage. And then it starts moving upward. It wants to find the lowest bid for each area. So it looks at, at, at bids in ascending percentage order. And for a given area, it assigns the first bid it comes to. That, that is the one at the lowest percentage. Okay, now keep in mind here, the T and L doesn't matter for assignment. All the system's looking at is percentage, but it will affect the amount the, winners, the winner will receive. Okay, so it, as it assigns bids in ascending percentage order, the auction system calculates the effect on the budget of each assigned bid. It keeps a running tally of its of how much money it's kind of set aside for a given bid at this point. And at some point, it will get to a point at which to what we call the clearing percentage. And that's the point at which the budget's just enough to cover support for the assigned areas and the areas that still have competition at the base clock percentage. Remember, there are areas at the base clock percentage that may have more than one bidder vying for support. One of those will eventually win, but the auction system has to set aside money in its running tally to cover the assigned support to those areas. But once it gets to that clearing percentage, it stops assigning bids. Any areas with bids above that won't fit in the budget and they won't be assigned those below do get assigned. There's a slight exception for this for package bids. We'll get to that later, and you can look it up in the technical guide for more details. Okay, the, you'll recall that a couple times I may have mentioned that the bidder will receive support at least as high as its bid percentage. That's because we use a second price rule to determine support amounts. To give you a very high level example of the second price rule, assume I want my house painted and I ask a number of painters for bids. If I'm following a second price rule, I will hire the painter that gave me the lowest bid, but I'll pay him at a price that the second highest, second lowest bidder gave me. So that's the second price, basically. Now, we're gonna generalize that principle to this auction, and I'll describe it like this. What we wanna do is select winners, those bidders that are willing to accept support at the lowest percentages, but we're going to determine the support amounts based on the percentage at which competition is resolved. Now think back to my painter example. The winning bidder was chosen basically because he submitted a bid that was just that was lower than the second lowest bid. So the point at which competition was settled, the point at which he became the winning bidder was really the second price, was really the point at which there was competition was settled. So remember in this auction, we've said a couple times, we have competition across areas for a share of the budget, and we have competition within areas among providers. I'm gonna walk through these two cases separately and show how the support prices are determined by the second price rule. Okay, case one, these, this is competition across areas for the share of the budget for the most part. So these are bids for areas for which there were no other bids below the clearing percentage. 
And remember, at the clearing percentage, the budget's just enough to support the areas below and not enough to support the areas above the clearing percentage. So nationwide competition among areas is resolved at the clearing percentage. So we're going to use the clearing percentage as the quote second price for bids that are assigned with no other bids below the clearing percentage. That we'll call that clearing percentage P star and just plug it into the formula instead of the PP. And that's how you can figure out the support amount at the second price for an area. If that area was assigned when there were no other bids below the clearing percentage. Here we have here we see it a slightly different way. Back to the example, T plus L equals 45, reserve plus 200. The bidders, the bidder put in a final bid at 132.5%. Say just by coincidence, that happened to be the clearing round at 130%. The clearing percentage turned out to be 137.5%. So anybody with bids above that was not assigned, but bids below that were. Your assigned support is 185%. In other words, we use your T plus L, your reserve price, but the P star is a 137.5%. Okay, case two, where we're trying to, where we have competition within an area. And these are bids that eventually win support in areas where there were other bids below the clearing percentage. That can happen sort of two ways. It may happen in the assignment round or may happen later. But in the assignment round, bids that were assigned when there were two or more bids at different percentages at or below the clearing percentage, the bid at the lowest percentage wins and is supported at the percentage of the next lowest bid. It's following the second price principle. And then if there were multiple bids at the base clock percentage in the clearing round, we have more clock rounds until only one bidder for each area remains. And in that case, the lowest bidder for an area will win and be assigned support at the percentage at which the next lowest bidder drops out. For example, the base clock percentage for the clearing round is 90%, a different example. Um, and the system finds a clearing percentage of 96% within that range of 90 to 100%. And there are bids for a given area at 91%, 93%, and 97%. The 91% bid is assigned at a support percentage of 93%. So this is the second price. So the second price principle is more obvious when we apply it to competition within areas. But note that this is also consistent with that general principle. These are the prices where competition is resolved for these specific areas. Another example, back to our original one. Um, in this case, <coughs> there is another bid for an area below the clearing percentage. Our bidder put in a bid at 132.5%. Somebody else put a bid in for the same area at 135%. Our bidder wins, but his assigned support is calculated at the 135% percentage, which in this case comes out to be $180. So again, this is at least what he bid, at least his, bids, his bid percentage. Okay, so what happens after the, the clearing round when all of the work is, so much of the work has been done? There will be additional clock rounds with bidding only for areas that had multiple bids at the base clock percentage of the previous round. These are bids for the same areas by the same bidders at the same T plus L only. You can't change areas, new bidders can't jump in. It's just resolving competition that had been established in the previous round. 
We'll have as many of these rounds as needed to resolve all competition. Bids at the base clock percentage carry forward to the next round. So if the clearing round was at 130% and there were multiple bids at 130%, they're still available or basic to the system in the next in the next round. We'll set a new clock percentage, which may likely be 120%. Bidders can make lower bids you know, above 100%, uh, above 120% if they wish. But the bids at 130% are still in the system. And for each area, the bid at the lowest percentage wins, as we've said, but supported at the percentage at which the next lowest bidder drops out. So rounds continue until after the budget is cleared and there's no area with more than one bid at the clock percentage. Bam, gavel comes down. However, I'm going to continue a little bit, a little more in detail. Okay, here's an additional topic, package bidding. So far we were talking about submitting bids for areas to individual areas. Now we're going to point out that a bidder can also submit a single bid for a group of areas. So this is called a package bid. The package bid must be submitted at a single percentage, the base clock percentage or an intermediate percentage, up to the previous base clock percentage as for any bids. Within the package, there may be bids at different TNLs for different areas. A given area can only be included in one bid either for, it could be a single area bid or a package containing the bid, the area, but only, only in one place. And packages may be partially assigned. This is important. These package bids for this auction are not all or nothing bids. Under our proposal, a package bid must include a minimum scale percentage. And this is a way of giving the bidder some control over how much the package of the package will be assigned if it's going to be assigned at all. So we propose that this bidder specified minimum scale percentage be capped at 80%. So what this means is that the bidder may be assigned support for only some of the areas in the package, but as long as the total amount of implied support for those areas is at least the minimum scale percentage of the total implied support associated with the package. That's kind of a mouthful. In other words, the bidder may be assigned support for part of the package, but he has to be given at least the minimum scale percentage of the total package support amount. Maybe an example will make this clearer. Suppose a bidder submits a package bid at a 70% minimum scale percentage. None of the areas in the package will be assigned if the auction system can only assign areas with implied support totaling 65%, for example, of the total support for the package. In other words, this possible assignment doesn't meet the minimum scale percentage, so none of the areas are assigned. The partial package will be assigned if areas with implied support totaling, for example, 95% of the total package support can be assigned. So if the system can assign more than 70% of the total support for the package, it will partially assign the package. And of course, if all the areas in the package can be assigned, the package will be fully assigned. Okay, just to touch briefly on assignment procedures for package bids. In the clearing round, package bids are considered for assignment in ascending percentage order, just as single area bids are. But if the system comes to a package bid for which the minimum scale requirement cannot be met, say because some of the areas already were assigned at a lower percentage, then the package is not assigned. 
And a package bid at the base clock percentage of the clearing round, if it's contested, in quotes, will carry forward to the next round. So in other words, if you'd submitted a package bid for areas A, B, and C with, say, a 50%, 65% minimum scale percentage, and area A had already been assigned, or excuse me, um, an area, there was somebody else who had bid on area A, the system may assign you B and C because it meets your minimum scale percentage, assuming all of the numbers work out. I'm grossly simplifying here. But A, which was tied at the base clock percentage with another bidder's bid for A, those bids will carry forward to the next round. If there were more than just A, they would carry forward as singletons. So for more details on processing package bids, please see the technical guide. Okay, another option for bidding, proxy instructions. You have the option of telling the auction system to submit a proxy bid in each round, as long as the bidding percentage is at least a certain bidder specified minimum. In other words, you can give the system instructions that say, bid for me as long as you can bid at at least 72%. And in every round in which the system can submit a bid consistent with those instructions, it will do so. And those bids are treated just like bids you had submitted manually. Those bids can apply to a single area or to a package. And at any point before the proxy percentage expires, in other words, below 72%, whatever, you can change that number or take it out. So why this may be very helpful is because it safeguards against you missing a bidding round. And that's important if you go back and think about those activity rules. Remember, you can't bid for more implied support than you bid for in the previous round. So if you forget to bid and miss a round, you're greatly limited in what you can bid for in the next round. You don't want to miss a bidding round. Okay, last additional topic, one you cannot ignore. You can ignore proxy bidding instructions or package bidding if you want to just bid for individual areas manually every round. But everybody must pay attention to the prohibited communications rule. So rule section 1.21002 prohibits auction applicants from collaborating or communicating in any way with any other applicant regarding any applicant's bids or bidding strategies unless the applicants are members of a joint bidding agreement disclosed on their applications. So this applies to applicants starting at the application deadline and continues regardless, whether they, regardless of whether they eventually qualify to bid or whether they actually do bid. And an applicant includes any entity apply, includes the entity that's applying, any party with control of the entity, any party controlled by the applicant entity or controlled by a party controlling the entity. So it's a broad definition. Be careful with communications to third parties that may be conduits for prohibited communication. Please take this rule seriously. Consider past guidance on this and related rules for spectrum auctions. The reference is given here. That concludes my portion of the presentation. Please email any questions you may have, if you haven't already, to auction903 at fcc.gov. We're going to take a short break, and we will return at what time? At 2.10. We'll return at 2.10 to address questions that you've submitted. Thanks. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, 
we're going to try to answer uh, most of these questions and um, particularly those with, with general applicability uh, to a lot of the attendees. Um, for some of the very detailed hypothetical questions, uh, we may uh, solve with folks individually on those. So uh, one of the questions was asking when the slides will be available for download. We are planning to post the slides this afternoon uh, on the web page, the event web page for this webinar. The full recording of the webinar with the, with the voiceover presentation we're planning to post later this week. Okay, and then um, I'm going to take a couple of the a couple questions and then we'll have um, other subject matter experts who are here will handle some of the others. So one of the questions asks what, what defines an area? And as proposed in the comment PN, the, the areas eligible for bidding in the auction would be census block groups. And those would be the, the eligible census blocks within the census block groups. And as a follow-up to that, ask if we have um, broken down the support amounts on a per county basis. And there will be, a, um, again, that the geographic area is the census block group, not the county. And there will be a reserve price established for each census block group. And as, as we mentioned in the presentation, those the reserve prices are derived uh, from the, the Connect America cost model. Okay, and so one more thing when every census block group has a code assigned to it by the Census Bureau and that the county code, the FIPS code, is the first five digits of that, I think it's an 11 digit code, the first five digits of that basically indicate which county the census block group is in. And then and when we, we do post the the final list of eligible areas will indicate which county the census block group is in. So we just wanted to clarify that the the bidding as proposed would be by census block group. And now I will um, turn this over um, to have um, Heidi answer a couple of the questions that came in. Sure, thanks Chelsea. So we had a question about what happens if a recipient does not offer the required service to the required number of locations. Um, so I'll just remind everyone that compliance is going to be determined at the state level. So what that means is we'll add up all of the locations that are near winning bids per state. And that will be the number of locations that you're required to offer service, meeting the performance tier and latency requirements. And we expect that bidders will do due diligence prior to bidding to make sure that they're able to identify enough locations to meet those requirements. And if at the end of their, or if at each interim build out milestone, you'll remember that there is a um, six year build out period, but there are interim build out milestones during that period. If the recipient does not offer service to the acquired number of locations at that build out milestone, they'll be subject to certain non-compliance measures that includes reporting and withholding support and eventually um, being required to return a certain percentage of your support that corresponds to the number of locations that you have not served. And all this is laid out in great detail um, in our December 2014 Connect America order. The number for that order is FCC 14-190, and the discussion starts in paragraph 142. So I encourage you to look there um, for more detail. We also received a question as to if a winning bidder is required to apply for eligible telecommunications carrier status. And yes, 
all winning bidders will be required to obtain an ETC status in the areas where they are um, seeking to be authorized to bid. Entities that are subject to their state jurisdiction will be required to obtain that ETC designation from the state. Otherwise, they should seek ETC designation from the um, FTC. And they will be required to offer a standalone voice service in addition to the broadband service. And then finally, we received a question about how to determine from our preliminary eligible census block list whether census blocks are within a census block group. And as Chelsea mentioned, um, each census block has a code that um, will tell you whether the census blocks are grouped together into a census block group. The census block group is determined by the first 12 digits of the 15 digit census block number. The first two digits are the state. The next three digits are the county, as Chelsea mentioned. The next six digits are the tract. And then the final digit is the block group within the tract. And then there's the final digits for the census block. So you can look at the preliminary list that we've already released and looking at the code, if the first 12 digits match, they're all in the same census block group. And I'll hand over to Oh, to Martha, who will answer some questions. Hi, the first question I'm going to address has to do with the budget. It seems the question reads, it seems the auction will distribute less than the total budget because the clearing round occurs where the requested funding is less than the budget. And then bidding continues in areas where there are two or more bidders. What will happen to the money remaining after the auction is complete? Well, to back up a little bit, um, yes, it's possible there will be some money left over, but this auction was designed to use as much as possible of the budget, given the parameters determined by the commission. Um, and just to add a little bit of detail, in the clearing round, the system comes as close as it can to using the full budget at the when it determines the clearing percentage. So as the system is, is, ascend, is assigning bids in ascending percentage order, keeps us running tally, as I mentioned. And in calculating the running tally, it takes into account that the assigned bids will all be supported at, quote, the second price, which is a higher and higher percentage as it goes through the process of assigning bids. So up to the clearing percentage, it's taking into account that it's paying all the bids that were bid at lower percentages at the clearing percentage. And so that it stops there when it's come as close as it possibly can to using up the full budget. But then we do have some areas that set aside some money to cover the most expensive option for bids for areas for which there's more than one bidder at the base clock percentage. And so to the extent that those bids are bid down or a less expensive option is eventually assigned, there will be a little bit of money left over. But so we hope there won't be a lot, but to follow up with the second part of this question, um, it hasn't been determined yet exactly what will happen to any monies that are remaining. And I see there was another que similar question. Um, is there any mechanism for assigning money below the budget amount to fund to additional blocks? Um, no, this is the auction mechanism. That, that's as far as we, that's as, the best we could do for using up the, the budget at this point. Okay, another question for which there are two similar um, submissions. After the clearing round, if there are two bidders remaining for a certain area, what happens if those two bidders then drop out at the same point? So for example, the clearing round is at 100%. At nine, both bidders for a certain area agree to accept the next 
base clock percentage of 90%, but neither one of them bids past that. Then we use a random number to break that tie. But bear in mind that you can bid at very fine percentages. So somebody, to avoid things going to a tie, one of those parties may want to bid at 89.99%, for example. Let's see, another, yes, another question was exactly the same one. What if, happens if both bidders decide to drop out after the clearing round at the same percentage? Yes, it goes to a tiebreaker. Okay. Third question. Can the same entity submit a bid for a, an area at the gigabyte level, level for a certain amount of time and then if the price gets too low, switch its bid to the next performance tier so that it can continue to participate in the auction. Yes, you can switch your, you can switch to bidding for a different T plus L. However, keep in mind that you can't bid for a negative or a zero amount of support. And that when you switch from bidding, say from a gigabyte with a zero weight to a performance tier with a, a higher weight, um, your su implied support amount is going to kind of jump down a bit, not only with the uh, decrement in the bidding percentage, but with the adjustment to your reserve price. So yes, you can, but you must bid for a positive support amount. Yes, and that's only until the budget clears that you can switch. After the budget clears, um, you're restricted to bidding for the same um, T plus L. Yes, someone else asked, may bidders change their performance tier during the auction? Yes, prior to the, bud to the clearing round. Okay, let me see what I have next. Oh, are you able to discuss why 80% was proposed for the package percentage? Why are there no all or nothing bids? There are a large number of areas, eligible areas in this auction. And if package bids were all or nothing, large packages could potentially block other large packages from being assigned leaving many areas without support. So 80% was proposed, and you can comment on this, this, this proposal, as a relatively high number that still allowed enough flexibility for the auction system so as not to allow packages to block other packages. And just to that point, um, some of us are thinking of this in terms of spectrum auctions where we're assigning licenses. And um, if you don't win a spectrum license, you can't provide service there. But here we're, we're distributing support money and there's nothing prohibiting you from providing service in an area, even if you don't get money explicitly um, for that area. I mean, it's clearly you have to um, satisfy the performance requirements in the areas for which you receive support, but you can, you know, use other money from other sources to fill in um, holes if, if you want to. And this bit, this question continues, could bidders instead view how much the, their bid is accepted and say whether or not they want to take the bid? No, the being able to determine the minimum support percentage, minimum scale percentage, is our way of giving bidders that, that uh, control, that voice. Okay, does somebody else want to take over for a little while? Hi, this is uh, Corgi Wiener uh, from the Auctions Division in the Wireless Bureau. Um, we have um, a question about prohibited communications and uh, 
asking for a bit more information about the joint bidding agreement and what will be required for such disclosure. Um, I point you to paragraph 21 of the comment PN, which proposes to use or to adapt the uh, definition of joint bidding agreement from our um, wireless spectrum auction context for this purpose. And uh, basically uh, proposes to um, it, that a joint bidding agreement is one that relates to any eligible area in the phase two auction and addresses or communicates bidder bidding strategies, including arrangements regarding phase two support levels. So um, that would be, that's the proposal to use that as a definition of a joint bidding agreement. Um, generally, the advice to look at past uh, application uh, and statements of the commission and staff regarding prohibited communications could be helpful here. I think in general, when we talk about whether or not an agreement exists, we look to whether or not all the, um, and I think we've said this and you can find this in other public notices, whether all of the uh, major terms have been agreed to, uh, whether or not the agreement is written. So you need to uh, be quite uh, clear that you actually have an agreement. Um, and I'd also just want to point out that the agreement needs to be disclosed by all parties to the agreement on their applications. So hopefully um, that helps. There's a, another package bidding question here about if a package bid is partially assigned, whether a bidder can turn down blocks one. And um, the answer is um, no. The, uh, that goes back to the slide that, may, that Martha talked about, which is that if your bid wins, you were obliged to provide the service at the performance requirements um, that you bid for. Uh, for the support that you get. And the point about the minimum scale percentage is to provide a bidder with the ability to decide that a certain amount of money will enable that bidder to serve any combination of, uh, and not necessarily all, of the areas within the package bid. Um, and I think the last question I have is about uh, information to be provided during the auction between rounds, um, and specifically, will bidders know the service levels of competing bids? Um, the answer is that is not what has been proposed. Uh, paragraph 135 of the comment public notice lists what is proposed to be disclosed, and that is not on the list. Um, and um, so that is, uh, that is, it, it is part of, uh, it's related to our use of so-called anonymous bidding. And um, in generally in our auctions, we withhold information that may allow bidders to uh, guess at or uh, um, identify the identities of other bidders, and we withhold information that is more likely to do that than not. And I think that's the end of my questions. Okay, this is um, Chelsea again. And, um, a couple more questions that have come in. Do you anticipate the current census block and location data? changing significantly based on this year's Form 477 updated data. Um, at this point, um, we don't know exactly how the, um, some of the inventory of, of census blocks and census block groups eligible for it. The auction will change uh, once we have analyzed the areas uh, using the most recently available Form 477 data. Um, as far as the, the number of locations for in, um, in each block, that um, 
number was assigned by the Connect America cost model and does not change uh, in this entire census block as either in or out of the auction. And then there was a, a question about what happens to areas where no one bids. Um, areas in the auction with no winning bids uh, will be considered for uh, the Commission's Remote Areas Fund. Hi, yes. Um, I have a couple more questions. Can the auction end without clearing? It seems the design is relying on some areas not being bid. I'm not exactly sure what's, what's envisioned here, but it, we start out the auction and in the first round, after bids are processed in the first round, as in after every other round, the auction system will determine whether the aggregate um, implied support at that percentage fits within the budget. And it's possible that the answer is yes, even in the first round, in which case we move to the assigning bids and determining support amounts. Um, or the alternative is that the implied support total implied support after the first round of bidding is greater than the budget, then we go on with multiple rounds until the budget does clear. So no, the auction won't end without clearing. Although I will add a caveat that as in all of our auction PNs, we reserve the right to cancel or pause the auction for any reason. I'm just throwing that out there because we do say that. Uh, I don't envision it happening for this reason, but who knows? Okay. Another question. Can a bidder switch between bidding for a package and bidding the individual areas between rounds? Yes. No problem. You have to pay attention to the activity rules but if you were just bidding on the same areas in a package or individually, you would have the same, you, you're, you'd be fine with the activity rules. Okay, another question. Nothing direct was said about bidding below the clock. Can a package bidder just make a bid for all areas within a state at say 80%? And how does that factor into future rounds and the future ability to make changes? I'm wondering if this question was actually about uh, entering proxy instructions at uh, a proxy percentage below the clock percentage. In general, during a bidding round, bids are permitted any percentage at the new base clock percentage or up to but not including the prior rounds base clock percentage. So if you submitted a proxy bid with a lower percentage than the current base clock percentage, the instruction would be interpreted by the bidding system to submit a bid for the round at the base clock percentage. It wouldn't submit a bid at a, a bid lower than that because bids aren't accepted at lower percentages. So um, if I didn't understand that question correctly, um, you can email us again. Um, this is Barney again. Um, we have a follow-up question on joint bidding arrangements um, and whether or not the disclosure of a joint bidding arrangement um, affects eligibility. And um, I, I believe the answer is that the joint bidding arrangement is not, um, this does not determine eligibility in a particular state. In other words, each party to the joint bidding arrangement needs to establish its eligibility independently uh, based on uh, many of the points that Heidi talked about.
Okay. Uh, I think that we have gone through all or most of the questions we've received, or maybe a few um, really, as I said, detailed hypothetical questions that we will follow up with the folks individually. And um, we thank everyone for participating today. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to email us, and we will work on getting the slides and the whole presentation uh, posted as soon as possible. Thank you.